Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld and the September 22nd DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, we got to talk to uh, Matt Lawrence from Faction about his take on our take about his conference, uh, his session about hybrid cloud. And he's doing some amazing things about multi-cloud, interconnect, AI, um, and he provided a huge amount of data um, and ideas and, and really details about what they're doing. So great topic, uh, the whole thing. So start to finish, one hour. Enjoy it. Matt, thank you. Right, for hold on, hold on, hold on. You'll, you'll get this one, Rob. You probably haven't seen this, but it'll probably crack you up. Hold on. I like yours. I like the depth. <laughs> there you go. That's good. I was on a call with Keith and screenshot his background. Uh, <laughs> you, you know the text is reversed for us, though, or not? Is it? Let me. There's some way. Is it? It's hard. It's Zoom. Zoom is not happy. If, you mirror, if you mirror, it mirrors. And so it's. But does this make it look normal to you now? No. Weird. I hit mirror my video. So are you seeing it flip back and I can forth? Show, I can show. I can show you what I'm what I'm seeing from you. Yeah. Screen share me sharing with you. Yeah. Hold on a second. I will do that. Desktop. There you go. Get in the corner so I don't reveal. Oh, I hit mirror videos. my video and then it didn't actually mirror it. Hold on. Zoom is oh. Zoom is really sort of frustratingly tricky about that. Interesting. I thought that thing flipped it around. Oh, actually, I continue. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm sure I can. I can flip this. I can invert yeah. this. Okay. And I just I was just giving you the heads up because it's you don't know how your video stream looks. It's. It's true. And I still have my left and rights are backwards. Yeah. It's probably appropriate that this like <laughs> not look that. normal, like a bizarro, bizarro <laughs> CTO advisor. Let's see. All right. I'm going, I'm stopping the, I'm pinning you back to my, my background. Hey everybody. Next, next week, oh, there you go. Next week is um, VMworld. And it's actually 30 minutes in set. I, I, I goofed and I scheduled another Zoom meeting on it, like another Zoom ID. So this ID will be, it will use a different, need a different Zoom ID, unfortunately. But we'll work it out. I'll just stay tuned for updates on it. I still have to fix the audio. You were Matt. You were our guinea pig last week on the um, on the watch party. Oh, I, I okay. still have. So we're we're streaming. Wait, uh, Matt, you gave that talk last week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> oh 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 yeah 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 oh the multi cloud talk what was I doing it was bright talk oh my god I do so many of these things now I just completely lose track um, you know it's the it's like a symptom of of the COVID era right you can't host events or do really conferences and so basically all of your you know kind of outbound marketing turns into you know, virtual events and I, I end up doing a lot of them so but yes yeah Rob said you guys hopped in on that. We were chatting and um, there were some really good questions, um, implications actually from what you were describing. So we wanted to do it. But, but so normally what we'll do is we'll chat for about 10 more minutes and then we, we go to the topic of the day to create, it's sort of a hallway, hallway, hallway space from that, that perspective. Um, so. So does anybody have it, something interesting from a, a hallway track conversation or something that they want to they want to bring up? I've been I've been doing uh, icebreaker questions on the twenty thirty Thursday the Thursday groups. Um, those are those have been sort of fun. I mean, I have a question that Matt might be able to answer. Well, so um, it was exactly that. As, as we were listening to your talk, 
um, the, I was unfamiliar with what, with what your company does. And I was saying, wow, it sounds like a cloud broker or a data broker. And I was just thinking about, so I've heard of the existence of cloud brokers also for, for, for getting cloud services in general, just be, uh, just be able to, to get cloud services for cheaper and also for the idea of network bandwidth between cloud services. And I was curious to just to hear more about other use cases for these things, because I know it exists, but I'd like to hear about other use cases for, uh, for, for those services that your company, your company does, right? Sure. It's interesting too, because we're not really involved in the finance side. And, you know, one of the observations I made a couple of years ago is I remember Googling for something like AWS to Azure connectivity and like the number one hit is like, how to set up a VPN between clouds. There didn't seem to be a lot of people who would deal with it in a way where, you know, you could have an environment in one and an environment in the other, and you wanted to stitch them together on private networking, um, which we can do, although it's not really a focus. Um, so um, we're the, the like tiny little company that nobody's heard of, right? Cause we're just a little over a hundred people. Um, and we have this weird background doing, you know, VMware private cloud stuff. And we still run thousands of private cloud hosts across like nine nodes around the globe. We do a lot of DR services to VMware Cloud and AWS um, as well. But if you look at historically speaking, we've been kind of vectoring towards this like multi-cloud world. And there's just some stepping stones. You can't just take a business like we were, just jump into it. And, and the big stepping stone for us was we had already kind of built the beginnings of this uh, multi-cloud storage platform and <clears throat> VMware announced VMware Cloud and AWS. And, you know, back in my personal history, I was at VMware and was one of the architects that worked on vCloud hybrid service that came vCloud Air. And this explains how I ended up, you know, kind of looking at product work because it's like a lot of awesome engineers putting a lot of time into something where I was like, I don't understand why we're doing this because we have 4,000 partners that do this and I don't see us building anything that's differentiated. Are we building something that's, you know, great? Are we doing something that like, you know, follows all the best practices and, you know, we're going to operate it really well. Sure. But um, it, it was frustrating. And when I saw VMC come out, I was like, oh, this is what we should have built all along, right? This is like differentiated. And if you're really trying to like do digital transformation, being able to take your workload and put it in inside of Amazon without changing a lot of your process or your application architecture, and then being able to kind of do these gentle little stepping stones without worrying about data gravity, that's awesome. But one of the things we figured out was there just wasn't enough storage attached. And so we took our platform and VMware was you know, nice enough to work with us on an integration where VMC could mount faction storage platform. And so we became this kind of a go-to partner around VMC because when people found they only needed like four nodes worth of compute, but they needed 12 nodes worth of storage, we could plug the extra storage in. Um, and so, um, that was kind of the, the stepping stone, but now we're, we're kind of fully launched on this thing. And, and we actually sell a ton of this via Dell basically. So Dell has this thing they call Dell Technologies Cloud Storage for Multi-Cloud. It's really completely faction. Like we're, we're building it, we're operating it, we're helping them sell it, we train their sales team, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, but we ended up doing some pretty cool things. Maybe I could share like a, picture. Yeah, hold on, let me open this up. Uh, and this is the thing that's been keeping me up. So I'll segue this into the personal, you know, part of this, but um, I'll show you this a noted thing from this project that I'm working on. It's going to turn into a presentation coming up at BioIT World and a white paper that ESG is going to do. Um, but we basically, you know, we were demonstrating this live, right? Like this is our platform down here offering this file scale out services, which are mostly based on um, Dell's Isilon platform. And we actually have, you know, connectivity to all three clouds. So we had, you know, um, direct connect plus express route plus, you know, interconnect all running. We had instance across these. I was running a Univa grid controller inside of uh, East US that was controlling nodes up to 100 systems, each with four GPUs. So I had nearly 400 GPUs at one point processing genomics data across all three clouds, all centrally located. Totally interesting stuff here. Like, for example, it was actually faster for me to process the data in place on our storage and even co copy it locally and process it, even if I didn't count the copy time in the job. Like the actual genomics job itself, which would take about an hour and 20 minutes, hour, 40 minutes on average, is like basically like 8% faster 
probably because the individual you know SSDs, if you copy locally, are so limited um, in terms of IOPS, right? Because your sizing them versus ours is a much more like centralized pool, and you can rob Peter to pay Paul from a you know scale out job perspective. Um, but it's pretty neat stuff. I mean, um, so. Uh, this is like the this is a real world version. There's some economics where we were looking at this from a GPU perspective, and what would it take if you're you know in the process of doing genomes, you've got some steady state, but you also have a lot of burst. Would you if you bought all the GPUs to be able to handle your burst versus say being able to put it on our platform and then use spot instances across the clouds and to do it instead? And I mean, tons of interesting lessons learned like spot availability. At one point, I had 70 NCS24 instances v2 instances on azure they got deallocated all of them and then i couldn't even turn up an on-demand instance and then two hours later i can get 50 of them back so i mean definitely a lot of capacity fluctuation that's all real um but yeah kind of fun project um but of course we did bridge the networks on these as well because i wanted my grid controller in azure to talk to the other two sides of things but um that's not even normally what we do too i typically just for security reasons, if somebody was going to connect multiple clouds, our default would be each cloud can talk to the centralized storage, but they don't cross talk because we normally have, you know, BGP route filters in place. But of course, you know, for my purposes, I said clear it, which we can do. It's not like a problem, but it's funny how people are more interested in the storage in the middle than they are in the direct connectivity between the clouds for whatever reason. So I don't know. Long way of answering a question, but this is the huh. this is the sort of thing we've been doing a lot of lately is these large data sets sitting between the clouds where you really do want clouds and you know if you see me do presentations i usually spend some time talking about innovation right this idea that we're getting towards a world where you're going to want to use kind of more platform or SaaS level services in each of the csps and kind of boxing yourself out by saying i'm just going to put all my data in amazon or all my data in azure boxes you out from the innovation on the other clouds but by the same token, you don't want to make three copies and sync three copies and so on. So, um, and even just something like spot availability speaks to that point, right? So if Azure shuts all my instances down, but I really want to keep a job going, can I scale up in Amazon or can I scale up in Google? So that kind of flexibility we enable in, I think what I'd say is a relatively turnkey way. Um, you know, this was not hard. And for us, I mean, we're baking the connectivity of these platforms into the storage. So it's, you're not kind of architecting how to blend these things together. It's just available. So that's really I think, and, our focus. And a naive question, very naive question. How do you access these file stores? These are like uh, NFS shares or are these block storage? Yeah, so this, this one here, the stuff we're using for this, we have different tiers and different kind of offerings. The file scale out stuff, because it's based on Isilon, it'll do NFS, SIFS, HDFS, and object all like single namespace. So you can actually be pulling the same file over HDFS as well as NFS, as well as SIFS kind of all at the same time, even. That's just a like neat one FS feature. Do you provide a storage pl plugin for QNEs? Uh, there is one, yeah. So there is a CSI plugin um, for one FS that you can use. And it's actually been interesting. They had originally this thing they called, um, I think they called it ISI provisioner. And it was like a, non CSI plugin or piece of software you could use with Kubernetes that kind of did the same thing. And now they've actually made the CSI plugin work. And I actually did a POC with a very large enterprise recently where they were evaluating it. And it's funny because there's this like constant iteration of the CSI driver plus, you know, which version of Kubernetes you're running, et cetera. So you, you can run afoul of like version conflicts, but yeah, there is a CSI plugin for it. Absolutely. Um, and then some of the other platforms we have too, or, depending on your use case might be more appropriate. So we have a, the file scale out is really good at massive throughput and scale. And by the way, I mean, it can get gigantic. So we can do over 60 petabytes on a single mount point with thousands of instances accessing it. And in this, um, in this thing, actually, I'll show you this, uh, I'll show you a couple of screenshots. This is, hold on one sec, I'll pull these up. This is pretty good stuff. This is the early release here. <laughs> cool. Uh, is. You've concerned. Do you have? Do you want me to hold the recording from that perspective when I post it, or? I don't know. It's fine. Okay. Cool. Um, just checking. I, all good yeah. to know. Uh, I just need to get a second window open here so I can show both of these. Yeah, that one, and then 
again, this is just some stuff I'm like feeding into some of the, the white paper and, and so on work. Uh, let's see, is this it? Okay, so here's a here's a view of the actual cluster, right? So this is unit of a grid engine. Qhost basically just dumps the list of hosts that are part of the cluster. You can see this like seven hosts from this original Azure cluster, most of which had been deallocated because it was 60 at one point, and I'd just been letting it dwindle. And then 10 in Google, 20 in Amazon, and another like 50 that I turned up in a second scale set inside of Azure, all kind of stitched together into the platform. And then um, you can see here for this experiment, we had a very large pipe to Azure. So this is a 100 gig connection. We were, we were pulling 138 gigabits um, from these clients at that point, along with 10 gigs in um, GCP and 10 gigs in Amazon. So like, you know, at this point you're getting 160 gigs, so it's about 20 gigabytes a second uh, throughput uh, coming out of the system. So yeah, pretty, pretty solid. I mean, you know, this is a, effectively just a bit of a lab experiment too, so it's pretty neat. Um, but um, when it comes to the CSI stuff, I feel like with there's other platforms we have that are more oriented around like more random reads and writes, uh, you know, smaller block workloads. So if you were going to run something that you know was a little more transactional, for example, and less you know giant reads and writes, we would potentially do it on another platform. But they also, I think, most of them have CSI plugins now of some kind. Yeah, I'm I'm mostly looking at uh, uh, blockchain friendly storage. So lots of random reads writes, um, so low latency kind of, kind of stuff. Uh, where which is where a lot of the cloud provided uh, uh, CSI uh, like an Amazon Azure can fall fall short in, in that they're they're just not up to par to local NVMe uh, kind of throughput. Yeah, I mean, we're not, I mean, it always depends on what you're saying to you from a, like a local NVMe standpoint. I mean, we are ultimately cloud attached, not in the cloud. So you're always going to see a little bit of added latency. Um, like, you know, sure, depending on which of the AZs you're in in Northern Virginia, our round trip latency is somewhere between 0 0.9 and 1.5 milliseconds. That's pretty comparable, actually, almost identical to Amazon. And I think Google was a uh, was slightly more, but not much more. Like call it, you know, quarter or half a millisecond. You know, I have some exact statistics, some of which we've published on the web page, and then some of which we've been gathering for a refresh of that data. Um, but then on top of that, there's the storage platform aspect. So it depends on which thing you're you're getting. I mean, we have things that are based on all Flash, or like traditional Flash, where it's, you know, depending on what the load is, it's being put on it. it could be somewhere between call it one to two milliseconds would be in a sort of normal response time. But of course, you know, it varies a ton, right? If it's uh, small blocks versus, you know, larger blocks and the reads and writes percentage and considerations like that. Um, we have a new um, platform coming out that is NVMe based as well. Um, and so the actual kind of storage latency there we observe is like definitely sub milliseconds, probably six or 700 microseconds. So then you add that to the network latency and you see that, um, but you know, it sort of varies all over the map just depending on the use case and so on and so forth. But I don't know what the characteristics of good source for blockchain look like though either. So I don't know what, what, what the target you'd want is or what the workload look like in terms of block size and sequentiality and read write ratios and things like that. Cause those all play into kind of which, which platform is the best platform for a given workload. Yeah, I mean, latency in and of itself is, is not that bad. Like, uh, millisecond delays are, are, are fine. Um, it, it, it's largely the, the IOPS that, that we, we, we put on it, um, where, yeah. uh, I mean, a, a single node can easily uh, consume uh, up to uh, 10K IOPS, uh, uh, like on, on a blockchain it's, it, itself. And, and then when, when you're running, uh, How big is the volume? Multiple nodes uh, attached to the same storage. Uh, you you kind of run into issues with this. Uh, the other thing that 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 is an open thing for me to to explore and uh, um, and figure out is uh, we are running our nodes globally distributed, um, and one of the the 
the things that we would like to do is be able to snapshot uh, a node, say, in North America and have the data available in, say, uh, Southeast Asia. Sure. Uh, within Not in Southeast minutes. Asia. But I mean, let me describe like one thing that seems maybe like it falls in line, right? I mean, this is the whole like, it just, it depends conversation, right? But we have one particular offering, which we would call um, it file, file service elite tier. So it's like about as fast as that gets. Um, the starting footprint for this particular thing is 28 terabytes. And the 28 terabyte version basically comes with an SLO of 137,016K IOPS. So it would do a 2.25 gigabytes per second, probably largely unaffected by the workload characteristics. I mean, um, 16K is kind of like not the smallest block size, but I don't see a lot of things writing too much less than that. Um, and I mean, I don't know, it's fast. Uh, that's based on that NVMe system I mentioned. So it can go go quite fast and you can scale it up to, I think we can support, um, so we, the base connectivity basically is that and the throughput is based on like 20 gig connectivity essentially into the cloud or clouds, but you can scale that up to at least twice that. So um, you know, I think the, the assumption is that the system actually can drive effectively um, 30 would be nine gigabytes per second so 36 gigabits per second worth of 16k iops without you know suffering too much so yeah that, that might that might suit and it actually could support that system the underlying system with that we could support replicating between two sites so if you wanted to basically buy it site a and site b we could replicate from site a site b and essentially have the data or a series of snapshots of the data show up in site b as like read only copies. It's probably something where we can have, um, this is actually something that's on my list of things to drive with more automation, right? It's something like exposing snapshots automatically because we can't do it in a completely automated fashion now. We actually do automatically take snapshots for various reasons with some of these services, but we don't export them automatically as new amount points or, or, or iSCSI targets or anything, depending on whether your access wants to be file or, or block. Anyways, so yeah, might, might be suitable. Yeah, absolutely. I'll we'll take a look and uh, see where you go from there. Yeah, feel free to just drop me an email. I mean, we're, we're out in a little bit left field here as far as like, I feel like um, if I imagine like somebody typically off of our um, solutions team trying to trying to address this, I, I think they might, they might whiff on it. So, but yeah, I mean, you're welcome to reach out to them, but if it seems like it's going south, maybe hit me up sideband and it'll be interesting for me to drop in on that conversation and see how it goes. Cause this is one of those things that's, there are very few people who ask for this specific thing. That is the super high, they, not a lot of people have a um, cause that I've, that we've come across at least for this like super high performance storage, you know, that is this like multi-node accessible, multi-site, et cetera. And by the way, I mean, this is like, we're obviously, this is relatively expensive to This is one of the more expensive things in the portfolio because of the perform the extreme performance and so on. But, and the, and the network obviously is like pretty expensive. I mean, with all of our multi-cloud attached things, you know, because we are provisioning the network, you know, if you were to look at it over like a longer term, the network tends to be like one of the long tent poles of cost, right? Running all the, you know, direct connect to express route and, Google interconnect links. And we're, we're at pretty great scale on those and we're doing this in a pretty good way, but you know, still pretty, uh, pretty expensive, relatively speaking. So one of the questions that I had for you that, that we came up at the end of your, your topic is that you had sort of had, I'm, I'm pulling topic. I'm okay to keep going where we were. I'm, I didn't mean to jump in if you were still going. Um, oh, no. All right, good. Okay. So is that a lot of what you were describing is the benefit of, of the platform aspects of these cloud providers? And, and I mean, you're, you're still describing that. It's like, oh, I want to run an AI job on Azure and, and you know, take advantage of infrastructure on the Azure side. Yeah. And then you were, but then you were, you are using factions infrastructure as sort of this home base is the way it felt like. So it was uh, challenging this idea of, you know, 
using the cloud as an infrastructure platform or using it as a platform, as an app platform or as a services platform? And that's, so yeah. that's because right where you're, you know, somebody would say just use everything in Amazon or use the basic of your storage in Amazon and then farm out from, from there. Why, why the home base? Why? I have several questions, but why the, why the home base? First? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me, uh, let me, I think there's a diagram for this. Hold on. Cool. Let me see if I can find, uh, be useful. Because of the rule of data gravity, you force everything to happen <laughs> in his cloud. <laughs> data gravity is a is a very real a real component for this. But I I I'm going to bet dollars to donuts that it's cloud economics and uh, egress costs. Well, no, I mean, um, you know, we don't ma magically make egress costs go away. Although, if you um, you want to do anything that synchronizes between clouds we we can help now that having been said like our offerings that stitch and azure are egress free now the way that we provision is all is in a way that now you don't get dinged on egress in any way on the, the azure side so that's kind of convenient i think that there's probably a reference architecture that i probably need to do that talks about like multi-cloud practices where if you're going to use our service you might want to run you know something that like say receives data and does like an initial etl like if you want to run a spark cluster and kafka maybe land that in azure do the initial processing, you know, get the ETL done, write it out to the storage, and now that's accessible across clouds. And that way you, you have a no egress way of pulling data in, and now it's also multi-cloud accessible. Um, let me see. I'm looking for this diagram, sorry. Uh, and I, I guess part of what I'm, what I would go, I don't want to distract you while you're pulling it up. But. Well, here, here's what I'm going to show you, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and tease what I'm digging for here is this idea is we started looking at, um, at uh, like a training a neural net. As we were thinking about this from a deep learning perspective, I'm just going to use this as an example because we dug in a little bit, right? But we were thinking about, uh, we were looking at the Tencent project that did a, you know, 11 million image ResNet model training on image um, recognition. And, you know, the reality is I think every one of the big CSPs is doing a different, you know, thing to get their model. Like Google's kind of infamous for having a 300 million image trained, like labeled data set, which is grotesquely large, like so much bigger than I've heard of anybody else having at all. And yet no one's perfect, right? I mean, the, the, the top one on a particular image is never that fantastic. And even the top fives, you know, don't get to be perfect. And so, you know, we're not anywhere near approaching like what we do and we're people and we look at weird images and go, okay, that's, we get what this is. Uh, we were thinking, what if you as a company wanted to kind of build things like that, that maybe was specific to some IP or image set that you had where you didn't want to just, you know, you couldn't afford necessarily to classify it all manually and maybe you didn't have enough to train it the same way, but we, we can see this idea that you could start some initial training with a labeled set and, you know, and, and work towards doing um, you know, training and validation and that typical thing to try to get to the best results you can when you get to doing inference on it. But then what if you can then take that same data because it's multi-cloud accessible and you could feed those images into each of the CSPs kind of image recognizers, right? So what if you fed it into AWS recognition and Azure computer vision and Google, I honestly forget what they call their image recognition <laughs> service, but they've got one. Um, and then took those and actually plugged those into the training set, but not just naively. You don't just like label your data with their labels. You actually have it become an input, you know, and you actually build, you know, additional tensors for your training stage to look at those. And then do you get to a better inference, right? Now, I don't, you know, my data science view is relatively low, right? So I, I wonder like, is there a scenario where you run afoul of, um, you know, overfitting certain things by like feeding extra inputs from the CSPs or things of that nature. But I will say, you know, what we did find is we felt like it was realistic to have your data set and actually do some training on your labels and then checkpoint your model at that point and then experiment mm -hmm. with basically how your, your validation phase went after you did, you know, additional training specifically based on the CSP inputs. So if you can get to a better phase, then I think at that point you've kind of shown essentially you're, you're leveraging their services to make your own IP, which is your own model that you can do inference on better. Now, I mean, there's the pure hardware side, which is really easier. Just the stuff I showed you around the GPUs, this idea that, you know, sometimes 
spot instances will be cheaper or more available or there's a better hardware platform. I mean, my experiment with this, this GPU thing was eye-opening because nobody's the same, right? If I'm in Northern Virginia <laughs> and I've got my data, Azure has a ton of P100 cards. They've got almost no V100 cards. You know, Amazon has a ton of V100 cards. They also have some older stuff, but they have no Ps and theirs are expensive. So they're kind of missing that the P100 is actually kind of a sweet spot for the genomes because it's only a little bit slower, but it's much cheaper. You didn't um, play with and, Google's Ks? What was that? I guess you didn't play with Google's Ks. <laughs> Google's what? I couldn't hear uh, the word. K, K series cards, the, the ancient K series cards. Oh, no, they, they don't support it, actually. So I did, and what's funny <laughs> is when I kicked off the project at the start of this year, I would swear that Google in East um, US for Virginia area had no GPUs at all, which was disappointing. I'm like, well, I guess this proves my point about, you know, things being wildly different. And then I looked at it a couple of months ago as we were getting to like the phase where we ramped this up and they suddenly had T60 cards. Those are the uh, supported card. Um, but it's funny because there's three AZs obviously in East four. It's only in B. You literally can't turn up a GPU instance in A or C. It's only B right now. Um, so that's weird. Um, but it, but then now I've got all three clouds, different GPUs in every one, and, and Google's is the cheapest. I can build the instance for 88 cents an hour as a preemptible. Um, and Azure with a P100, which is a little faster, is a buck 11 an hour, um, typically, maybe a buck 14. Um, and, and actually, probably proportional to the time taken, that's probably, those are probably pretty comparable. Um, and then Amazon's, you know, got the fastest newest hardware with the V100s, and they also support like, the crazy Envy link, and they've got these elastic fabric adapters you can use for like crazy CUDA workloads if your stuff supports that. But then they're also much more expensive. Like the spot instance, uh, it's like $3.30 plus. Um, so an order of magnitude, which is totally not justified if you're you were kind of calculating like dollars per genome process. Um, so the hardware thing is real, but I think that, that that's not, to me, that's not innovation, right? That's availability. And yes, there's a difference between clouds and depending on your workload, that may matter to you. But the innovation around, okay, so these guys have, you know, a service that helps me turn my Jupyter notebook into real data science. That's a whole different thing. And then, you know, being able to train your model against multiple SAS, you know, level image recognition services. That's, you know, now we're talking about something that you really can't replicate with just one cloud because there is an sort of unassailable difference between the way they built their and trained their models in the first place. And I think if we were to kind of pursue the long tail here, we'd end up finding out that there's you know a lot more kind of under the hood around those use cases. Um, and I think, you know, in a world just, where we deal with some. Hmm? Sorry, you, you just said something that I hadn't thought through from a training perspective, because what you're describing are these AI use cases where those the CSPs have these models and if you're training your own models, then you're basically leveraging, you're building on top of what their models are from the training, is, is the way you're describing it. So it's not, like, this goes, I, I think, back to one of our questions, right? It's not just the infrastructure, it's actually the, the, the application set availability that you're leveraging. Oh, big right. time. I mean, okay. uh, it's very easy to prove the point with the hardware availability today, but, you know, hardware's hardware. Um, you know, if I project out, I mean, I, I say this a lot, but the cloud market's what, it's like 60 billion plus a year right now, something, give or take, right? tons. And it's on its way to hundreds of billions, right? I mean, north of 100 billion is in the bag and 200 seems pretty darn reasonable given a few years. So, I mean, if you're a company and you've got hundreds of billions of dollars of ARR and you've been recruiting all the smart people that will possibly be willing to come work for you, and your, and your margins, your gross margins are like north of 60% anyway. So like, it's a super great business to be in by and large. Like what's gonna stop you from doing anything and everything to compete for more business? And my thought process there is like, these services are sticky. You know, if, if, if what somebody wants is a, an instance with eight cores and 64 gigs of RAM, you can get that anywhere. And I mean, not just the CSPs, but DigitalOcean or, you know, you name it, IBM Cloud. But when you start going, hey, we've got this awesome thing that you know takes your Jupyter notebook and then builds this continuously learning, you know, retrainable model with a bunch of checkpoints and automatically exposes that via an API to your partner who can now like, you know, I mean, just we could start inventing some things that we could graft onto this. 
oh, and by the way, we've got the service that takes IoT data and does automatic ETLs for it. I mean, you know, you name it. These things are not going to be alike. It's not like eight cores and 64 gigs. And so this is a kind of our whole like thesis on being the multi-cloud storage platform is you know, you're going to have different use cases. And as time goes by, the large CSPs will get more and more differentiated over time because they're going to compete. And the best way to compete is to do something somebody else can't do. Right. It's not just copying your neighbor. And these guys all have enough revenue and they all have enough brain power and chops to build services that are unique. And they will have customers that ask for them. And then you'll be, you know, Mr. Large Enterprise and you'll have, you know, a team that uses a ton of Amazon, but you're going to go, hey, we got to do this. And somebody smart on your team is going to go, you know, Azure has this thing that does that. And if all your data is just in AWS, you know, you're going to have this problem of, well, do we move it? Do we copy it? So we solve that problem now. So and if, if we can be in a scenario where we can present you storage that inherently is as cheap or cheaper than single cloud storage that you can read from, then we also future proof you. So, I mean, that's part of the thesis. Um, and there's a bunch of other cool use cases. I mean, somebody, you know, we were talking earlier about the Kubernetes and the CSI plugin. And I mean, that's definitely one of those things um, because, you know, the idea that you can turn down a container to Amazon and spin it up in Azure a split second later with the data intact is pretty cool. So. I'm still scrounging around looking for the screenshot. I kind of stopped to get all animated there, but um, I'll see. I'll see if I can find it. Take it the background, and I'll show you a diagram. But it's basically this workflow okay. that kind of shows. I'll just, I guess, describe it. But it shows this kind of idea that you're going to do an initial training on a data set, and then it, it kind of shows the same process I was talking about. Going with, you know, I have my initial labeling, my initial training. I do a checkpoint, and then I kind of feed the, each individual. CSP's image recognition service labels back into it. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of, you know, train layer after layer on that to go see if you can improve. I, I guess, but at some point, I mean, it makes sense for if a customer has a stable base load and wants access to the data, spin it up with you, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, for sure. And I mean, it's other things, even the simpler stuff, you know. Um, I mean, it, there's things where we win just purely on like, sort of characteristics. I mean, the fact that I can put 40 petabytes on a single file share for you and, and then actually give you commensurate performance makes me unlike anything out there. I mean, even something like EFS, which is arguably the most performant of the CSP um, file share services, it can do a lot of throughput, but of the hood, if you look at what you can get off a given volume, it actually tops out at like 35,000 read IOPS and 7,000 write IOPS, I think. And if you're not doing one meg IOPS, that's pretty slow. And even if it is one meg IOPS, you've only just tied what I showed you in a screenshot, right? You're getting 140 gigabits and then you're done. And, and I can go to orders of magnitude. I could actually probably build something that across three clouds, I could probably push two terabits a second into the, the three CSPs combined. It would require a tiny bit of extra you know, engineering and there's a few constraints upon how you kind of build the cloud side of that, but it's definitely possible. Um, and that combined with multi petabytes and the, the single namespace thing, the fact that you can get it over, you know, over SIFs, over NFS, um, over HDFS, over object without having to, um, without having to like make an additional copy to transform it without having to like, you know, determine ahead of time what allocation goes to what is also a pretty cool feature. So it's not necessarily, we have some features that kind of differentiate anyways, kind of on the strength of some of those platforms, but. You know, aside yeah. from that, I think the multi-cloud thing is its own. I, I find this this to be fascinating because what what you're describing is you know the the CSPs are increasingly generic services, and I, increasingly generic on one level, but then I would say right. increasingly differentiated on the other level, right? So like the ah. everybody's got all the same instance types. Nobody lets it go. They all have to have, so every single one of them is doing, you know, GPUs, they're all doing, you know, tensor processing silicon in some way, shape or form, right? Whether it's, you know, a Google mm -hmm. TensorShip or Amazon Inferentia or whatever. Um, but then, you know, like I said, the stuff that's higher up the stack, I mean, you know, some of it will never be clonable because it ends up being based on their weird IP. Like no, no one's going to do a, a power BI exactly instead of Amazon or, I mean, one of the very first use cases I ever saw that was multi-cloud was people doing queries on um, Amazon Redshift and then taking the data and loading it into Power BI to visualize. Like, so, you know, 
I don't expect Amazon to come up with a Power BI replacement tomorrow or anything. Huh. I tend, yeah. I mean, there's there's an aspect in the in the in the I'm air quoting old days, right? Where that would be a software vendor running, and they would, you know, they would just it would be software that you could buy, not a not a locked in service back into the clouds. Um, yeah, when I talk about platforms too, I mean, this is kind of, I think my sort of uh, aspiration here is to drive more of what we're doing to be platformified because I don't want, I, mean, I want people to be able to bake all the capability that we're providing into workflows and, you know, automation and, and to even potentially do things in place that make sense. I mean, the funny thing about us is we're not just a storage platform. So, I mean, there's a ton of advantage that we have over something like a, like a net app cloud volume, right? Which is inherently just a single cloud anyways. But even if it were multi-cloud, I mean, it's smaller footprint and so on. But, you know, reality, end of the day, in many cases, they're delivering that by operating their gear inside of a data center. But I, I don't think that they can do a lot of the things we can do because we're running compute at scale too. It's a weird thing that just is a side effect of our having been this huge private cloud provider. It's not the focus mm -hmm. of the business, but it does mean I have a heck of a lot of compute nodes I have a team that's used to operating them. And so it's not a big deal for me to think about scaling out compute infrastructure. So if I say, hey, you know what makes sense is for us to actually offer like a you know, Spark Kafka ETL as a service that sits in front of all this inbound data so I can take the fire hose, land it then after its first ETL into the storage and then expose it. That makes sense. And so, you know, I don't know. That's, I think there's there's things we can do, and I'd like to platformify a few of these things, not to replace cloud services. My my mindset is always about like, how do I enable people to do better and more things less expensively, but more powerfully with all the cloud services by kind of being in the middle. You know, I, I want to be complementary to those and help people's cloud strategy out. It's not a it's not to me it's not competitive. It's complementary. Right. Well, I mean, what you're describing to me is exactly that. It's like, look, you know you know, a significant amount can just use general purpose stuff or, you know, so is it, wait, let me, let me back up. Cause I'm, you're, I like, I like what you're doing, but it's, it's not, doesn't fit neatly into the buckets of like all in on cloud and cloud first. It's, there's a component where you're like, this is general purpose, just use the cloud. There's a component where you're like, this is highly specialized to a specific cloud, use that cloud. And then there's this third category where you're, where you're saying, look, this is, it's not, doesn't fit their model exactly. It's not general purpose. I've got, you know, I can, I can help you with this specific use case. And you're not, you're not trying to grab like, oh, I need all of it. You're saying, I can help you with this use case where you need high IOPS and make this stuff go. That's the anchor. And then where you need cloud, you use cloud. Where you need the specialized services that they're built, you use those. It's, um, I don't want to say best of breed. And it's not exactly hybrid. I, I don't consider this hybrid or multi-cloud. It's, it's pragmatic computing. Yeah. I mean, I think we certainly help with multi-cloud just by nature of being an offering that inherently is delivered as a service that sits between multiple clouds where you can reprovision the network between them. Right. So in give it, you get a platform, right. If you go and buy the, you know, file scale out elite peer, it just comes with, 80 gigabits of connectivity. We'll carve that up however you want. So if you want 10 gigs of internet that you can use to VPN in from your on-prem and sync data, plus you want 20 gigs that goes to Amazon and 40 gigs that goes to Azure, and then your last 10 gig you're gonna throw a GCP just in case you need it, we'll do that. And if one day you wake up and you go, we're done with Amazon, we hate them, take that all down, we're gonna shift that bandwidth to Azure, we can reprovision that for you on the fly. And that's not baked in. And a lot of what we do is on, you know, termed contracts because we're still living in that world to a certain extent. Uh, but the the network connectivity isn't part of that. It's the the throughput is part of it, but the specific provision of the throughput is not part of it. So you do get to reallocate it, which gives you a lot of flexibility to kind of move it around. Um, and the, the multi-cloud nature of it, I think, is inherently useful for, I mean, people talk, talk and think about multi-cloud in a very different way than I do. And part of that is because there's a specific thing that I, we're, we're always trying to solve for. And a lot of people, I feel like when they say multi-cloud, they're just thinking like, hey, we've got sprawl across three clouds. What do I do? Right. And I, I often say, <laughs> you'll hear me say over and over again on webinars, yeah. multi-cloud multi is not multiple clouds. The fact that you have multiple clouds doesn't mean anything. Like, 
It just means like everybody, you've got this estate of IT stuff that just stretches across everywhere. And if you know several of those everywheres are clouds, okay, but that's not multi-cloud. But when we start talking about that ResNet model training that uses multiple cloud services, that's exactly multi-cloud. Like you are using multiple clouds in a way that one cloud would never do to get a result you can't possibly get with just one cloud. Now, I mean, the GPU thing is reasonably, you could apply that too. Like I can get better availability and better pricing by leveraging multiple clouds. And if that's my whole use case, then it's worth you know investing in an architecture like this and figuring it out because the gains are great. You know, you get more consistency, you get better pricing, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I mean, the GPU thing, of course, there's, a, there's an evolutionary consideration of some of this when it comes to like the hardware question. So I described the status I found it for Northern Virginia for public cloud, but what's it gonna be like a year from now? It won't be the same. They don't, they're not all in lockstep. They're not all <laughs> buying the same cards the same cycle. And so the, the kind of cost and performance and all those factors is gonna shift over time. And just being able to, you know, change that without moving all your data. And I mean, we do have customers that have petabytes and petabytes of data and trying to egress that out of one cloud to move it to another is a pain and it's an expensive pain at best, right? I mean, most of these things but, other than, you know, express route local circuits on express route direct, it's you're pretty much paying the two cents a gig at a minimum. And so, I mean, you apply that to a petabyte, it actually ends up being a pretty decent chunk of change. So do, so. You, do you see from that perspective that, um, I mean, it, it, with your model where the, the data is stored in, your, in, a, in a neutral location, then it's mostly ingress fees. And so access to the data to perform the analytics is, is cost optimized from that perspective, right? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly why when I say okay. that ETL is a service thing, I'm thinking very much now, like I said, I could do a reference architecture now, which would basically be put in Azure. So the Azure leg of our service is egress free anyways. And so if you feed it into Azure, they're not charging you for, for ingress, even over the internet, you can come through the ETL layer, however you want there, write it out to our platform, and then it's available anywhere. So you can kind of work around that if you're willing to, you know, go multi-cloud, um, you know, for the others, if you really wanted to be in Amazon and GCB, but not Azure, and you wanted this, then, I mean, that's where it starts to make sense. Now, we have a pretty great partnership with Dell, and they're also they're doing some work in the space. They're they're pretty keen on you know enabling like some of these streaming use cases. So they've built this whole open source project called Pravega that aims to kind of replace some of the less scalable parts of like uh, running uh, Spark and Kafka to do this. And it's pretty interesting stuff. I mean, it has some really interesting guarantees, you know, around consistency of data while still dealing with like ludicrous scale. And I mean, they're obviously, you know, working on that with people who are going to be taking, I mean, when we talk about the, what are you going to do with IoT sensors off, you know, millions of cars pulling bajillions of data points. I mean, this is, this is the real world. They're actually trying to do that. And it's not theoretical. They're like trying to solve the problem. So. Right. Would you expect that data to land on you first ETL and then move it, move it where you need to go? I mean, that, that would I'd, make sense to me. Yeah. But. I, Certainly, I, lo I love the I love the model for it, and I love I would love to do anything. You know, anytime I find we're, we're we've still been largely like volume infrastructure or whatever focused. But if I whenever I see a use case where I think, oh, this is sh something that should happen like directly next to the data, whatever that whatever that is, I start to think about like, would it be reasonable for us to provide this in the long term? Um, I think. Some of the places I'd like to go to is to enable a little bit more in terms of like data transformation, data movement. Um, so I mean, in almost every case, we can do things like site to site replication and presenting snapshots and things like that. But I'd like to be able to do more um, in terms of like, you know, even between platforms that don't support this at a hardware or like storage system software level, being able to, to like shadow volumes up to other systems, right? So you don't have to have an extra copy, but you can still kind of shadow them out from a deeper storage tier. Like this file scale out stuff we have um, that's based on 1FS, you know, you can have basically a cheap and deep tier and a middle tier and a super fast tier and let the data automatically move between those, right? So that's cool because we can now auto tier around for you and, and pull that up. But I'd like to well, do I, more of that wrote, across platform. I just wrote in the chat that imagine if you could do that, um, uh, you can freeze freeze data from one cloud onto a snowball and physically take that snowball in the same data center and plug it into a different cloud to offload the data as a way to get around data uh, egress <laughs> charges. Yeah. 
Never the funny it. thing is, I was say, <laughs> the funny thing is, you don't get to do that even with Snowball, right? You still pay the egress charges when you put data on the appliance. It's like, what are you paying yep. for at that point? And the answer is, you're, you're, they don't just don't want you to circumvent the system, right? Yeah, um, you're paying for the privilege well, exactly to use my Amazon. Idea. And and this is this is actually so on Thursday the topic for the cloud 2030 uh, discussion is cloud economics and data economics and I think that we're one of the things that I I expect is that the economic models have a bigger impact on consumption and people's architecture and design than than we want to believe from that perspective like and Matt what you're describing to me lines up 100% with that as a as a reality it's like yeah well you could do it this way but the cost would get would drive you nuts so it doesn't matter what your technical architecture is we're going to cost the weird thing it. is so much of that is based on the perception of cost than actual cost right because so few oh. people i think really understand necessarily how this how all these things work i mean there's so many things i mean Probably everybody here, if you're in a cloud, everybody's probably reading, um, what's his name? Corey Quinn, you know, on Twitter, right? Because mm -hmm. he's hilarious, aside from being informative. But it's like, you know, you look at some of these things and the number of complexity. I've done this with myself. Let me see if I can. Um, um, I have a cool slide, I think, that I actually showed. Yeah, it's this one. Hold on a sec. Slide and... Let me share this. This is one that we, I've used this in a bunch of webinars, right? But <clears throat> this is like, by the way, pardon my like mm -hmm. animation. I don't know what the hell is going on here. I actually think it's going to skip to the next slide, which is going to drive me crazy if it does. Oh my God, <laughs> I hate that. How do I get this to not do that? Please just stay there. Okay, thank you. There you go. I mean, so we just put this together just as like a, like what can, what are the things we can think of that affect like your storage TCO in the cloud, right? I mean, it's a lot of weird stuff, right? When you think about it, I can't stop it from advancing. It's just driving me nuts. Anyways, <laughs> like there's a lot of complexity. How many people do you think, even when they're thinking about, um, I just, maybe, uh, <laughs> pause it, sorry. I, I escaped out of like the screen view. But how many people, when they're thinking about this, actually think about all these things? And I mean, do they even, do they think to themselves, I'm going to need, you know, snapshots or, I mean, just the number of people, for example, who naively uh, think, okay, here's what I'm going to pay for my EBS volumes. And they don't even realize like what the failure rate of EBS is and like how it's not, you know, there's not enterprise durability here. Um, we worked for a while with a partner that was running a d database as a service platform inside of the, the public clouds. They had, bulk of it was in Amazon. And they had, you know, tens of thousands of EBS volumes. And they're like, oh yeah, I mean, you know, no, it's not astronomical, but we have them fail all the time. Like that's just a normal part of the workflow. You just have to be ready to recover. Um, so it's just not designed to be a five, six, nine kind of platform. And I don't think people right. count on that. And then egress is another thing. And then just, the like figuring out, oh, wait, I have to pay for, you know, API access, or I saw one Amazon contract that cracked me up because they baked in some free egress from, um, from Glacier, but it was phrased in this particular way. And I was only peripheral to this. So I was always wondering what was meant by this or what this really meant of the hood, but it said something like includes N number of retrieval includes the cost of n number of retrievals of 100 terabyte archives or something and i remember reading that and thinking do these guys when they're looking at this do they understand what the term means like archive do they understand like that they would have to group their files specifically into these archives to be put in a glacier and they can only retrieve them out in that atomic unit and that this is set up in a way where it's not this is not the equivalent of you know, when they say you get 2,100 terabyte retrievals, they're not saying you get to retrieve, you know, 20 petabytes or whatever. They're saying very specifically 100 terabyte retrievals. And probably if you accidentally stored something in Glacier that was five megs and pulled it out, you got dinged for 100 terabytes. And you probably don't realize how easy it is to burn through these credits. That was set up for their VTL system where you're doing virtual tape libraries with 100 terabyte units. Yeah, so that's very, very specific to a, a very, very, uh, you know, um, use case for that model. But yeah, I mean, I, I could see where that was marketed probably very wrongly or inappropriately. 
and people not knowing any difference would get burned by it. But it, maybe it was legit too, because it was for, I mean, that was related to backups and the storage mm -hmm. and backup, long term retention backups. So maybe it was okay. I don't know. But it's interesting. I still thought to myself, do they really know what they're doing? And I bet the answer is no. They might have stumbled into it being okay. But. I, this, this to me is the question I've been asking, right? Is people jump all in on these, on these platforms and the platforms are incredibly complex with a lot of moving parts that, and, and they'll get very wired into it. You know, do they realize that? Do they know how deep, how deep that rabbit hole goes? And then when, when do we start saying, oh, wait a second, I didn't, I didn't factor this in. I think Kubernetes is in a similar, right? As much as it's the, the leader and the de facto winner, it's still a complex platform. Um, so yeah, I wonder yeah. about that. I actually have what would be a whole nother hour of, of discussion around how you automate, um, what your automation strategy is from a multi-cloud perspective, because that's got to be a factor in how you, how you manage all this, right? You've got to have your customers consistent from an automation perspective. I think this is the, this is, I finally found, the, finally found the conceptual diagram where we were talking about basically around this whole, can we do this thing? And we never actually, this has not been fully built out. So, but, okay. uh, but we were, we were poking around at the edges of like, does this work in theory? And we think it does. And I actually have the whole, like, I basically got, I have 9 million images downloaded now to actually test this with. So I'm, oh, I'm somewhere on our platform, I've stashed away 9 million images from ImageNet and what the other open mm -hmm. images, all with the WordNet tags and so on. So we were gearing up to kind of do this. And then a lot of this other genomics were just kind of consumed my whole life. Uh, I only have so many hours I can put towards experimenting between, you know, actually trying to get real work done on the, the development <laughs> side and all the other stuff. But uh, these things are fun. And I think that this, this concept, whether it's this particular thing or not, has legs. Now, one thing that is cool is recently we've also gotten some time to prove out like interoperability of some of these services. So like the thing we're, we were just finished working on, we actually do have direct integration between HD Insight and our platform. And it's kind of on one level, it's like a no brainer because it's HDFS. I mean, it knows what an HDFS endpoint is. You'd think you'd be able to address us as long as it's addressable but it was never like a, you know, oh yeah, that's supported kind of use case because a lot of people don't, you know, nobody goes to Azure and goes, hey, can you support my external HDFS source for this? They're like, what? Right. It's like, who does that? But we made it practical. And so now we're trying to prove you can actually use it, which we did. So we, you know, we did some like, not nothing cool like image recognition. We did garbage like TerraGen, TerraSort, TerraValidate workflows, but inside mm -hmm. of HD Insight backed by our platform. But at least we can prove from a protocol interoperability kind of and SaaS service standpoint that the fully managed to do cluster they turn up can work with our platform. So I was kind of excited about that. Awesome. I'm more excited about this multi-cloud thing. That's cool. Thank you. We're, we're at the top of the hour, so we, we should start wrapping up um, from that perspective. I appreciate you coming in and, and basically going so much deeper beyond the slides <clears throat> from, from the talk. Sure. Um, I hope that I hope this was interesting. Everybody hung in, so I hope I'm assuming it was interesting to everybody else on the line too. Um, next week, good. Next week is uh, the VMworld session. Just a note: I'll open up the bridge 30 minutes ahead of time, and we can talk about whatever the keynotes are. If people are watching VMworld, then we'll talk about their VCF, their their predictions for the future. Uh, so there's a session about that, and we'll we'll popcorn and watch that, and then discuss it. So plan for another 30 minutes after for discussion. And I might be able to get uh, Kit, who's one of the speakers, has been um, promoting the session, our our session of his session, and so we might be able to get him to come on and do what Matt did for us, um, which I think would be super fun. And then we have a whole bunch of other topics. Um, Greg came in behind the scenes. He and I uh, scheduled him for the week after next. So we've got, hopefully we've got all that, that scheduled and Greg will be um, leading the discussion there. And then we have a couple other queued up topics around distributed infrastructure. Um, and then the, oh cool. And Mike, when just ping me on that, that'd be cool. Um, and I still, we're, we're working on the, um, the solution to Chris Love's problem, uh, Chris Short's problem. And um, 
that, that Rackend's working on, the granting special short-term use of downloadable assets out of S3. So at some point we'll do a presentation on that um, if people are interested. So lots of topics, bring topics. Um, please just let me know, uh, ping me one-on-one -on -one and we'll get you on the calendar. I love the DRP object not allowed to, to pull from S3 uh, error. That's always a fun one. Object not allowed. I haven't. Oh, is this related to the, the new stuff that we're doing? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're starting to store a whole ES. Oh my God. The, this, this was prompted by two things. Um, the ESXi images. ESXi images are one of them. And then the other one is people, the, the repos keep the mirrors, keep yanking the um, Linux ISOs. Mm. And so we're tired of that, frankly, but we also don't want to become a public mirror. <laughs> Why? So, it's only a little bit of bandwidth involved. Only in that. a little Come bit, on. only a, a, a teeny, a teeny bit of bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. just tiny. It's those, those ISOs are so, so svelte. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so that'll be, uh, that'll be an interesting one when we, when we pull it all together. All right, everybody, have a good week. If you can, come to economics discussion on Thursday. It should be a fun one. Is, um, now it's listed as Friday on the Cloud oh, 2030 page. Did I screw that up? I wondered about that because I'm like, isn't it usually Thursdays? It's, damn it. And yeah. it's listed as Friday, so hopefully a lot of people don't have that in their calendar on the wrong day. I'm fixing it right now, and it'll send out a alert. Okay. Good. Uh, God, <laughs> thank you. Jeez. No problem. Scheduling is always fun. It's <laughs> a mess. All right. Anyway, while I go look, my cheers, y'all. I'd Bye. love to uh, actually. Yeah, right. I'd, I'd love to negotiate uh, a time change. Just moving it half hour later, eight thirty. It would be so nice to just get that extra half hour. <laughs> I will bring that up with the group tomorrow, or sure. Thursday. I I'm I wouldn't object. They, so. they seem to though, but yes, even if well, you got, you got a couple of people who, who like it, like it means that they get to participate and it doesn't interfere with their day. Otherwise I assume. Yeah. But eight 30 would make a big difference. Okay. I will, I will bring it up and pass that on. Thanks. Of course. Talk to y'all soon.